Uh, it's really great to have all the Filipino brethren with us this morning. Um, I actually, I went there for a couple hours uh, yesterday to the retreat, and I says, and I, and I, but I'm leaving because I'm only partial Filipino, right? So, um, but it doesn't matter where we come from. Uh, we all uh, belong to Christ Jesus, our Lord, if we've made him Lord of our life. Amen? Amen. And uh, when, you might remember last week, uh, Marlon uh, reminded of us of the parable of the prodigal son. In that story, the father represented God, and we saw the incredible love of a good father. A father who longed for what was best for his son. A father who immediately forgave his repentant son. A father who rejoiced greatly when his son, his son returned to him after he had left. After he had wasted his time, he returned home again. He was uh, looking for him, and he ran to embrace him with great celebration. We know that that father... Did that father just love the son when he came home? Now, we know he, f he loved him even when he was off living a reckless life, even when he wasn't walking away in the ways that his father would have had him to walk. He still loved him because we recognize that love doesn't insist on its own way. Love gives the freedom for a person to sort things out for themselves, but that doesn't mean that there's not still love. Last week, we didn't talk too much about the other son. In fact, I don't actually remember talking about the other son, but maybe I missed that part of the sermon. I might have, that might have been the part when I was sleeping. I'm not sure. Uh, nobody sleeps during sermons, right? Uh oh everybody's asleep. Um, but the, the older son, you might remember what happened, right? Uh, the younger son came back, and there was this great celebration. And the older son was out in the field, but then he comes back and he hears this celebration. He finds out what it's about and he's uh, excited and happy. No, he's not, is he? He's actually kind of angry. Because, you know, here he was. Like, and his father comes in and says, oh, what, why can't you be ha happy? What's, what's the matter? Your son that was lost, like your brother like, like, that was gone, he's, now he's, he's back. And yeah, but you've never given me this great celebration. And the father says to him, well, son, you've always been with me, and whatever is mine is yours. Should we not have celebrated with this brother of yours who was lost, who was, who was dead and now is alive? Do we always remember just how blessed we are? See, that older son, he had everything. But he thought, well, I need to get some sort of recognition. I need to get some sort of celebration, and it's not fair that this son who wasted it all is now getting some sort of celebration. Are we ourselves able to rejoice with somebody else when things go really well for them? And maybe we've been working hard like all our lives, and then this person comes along and somehow everything seems to work out for them. Are we happy? Can we rejoice? You say, wait a minute, they, they don't really deserve it. The way that they wasted their life away? Do you understand, though, that as we talked about in the Lord's Supper, there's a reason to be thankful, and there's something that we can definitely be thankful for, and that is that, hey, guess what? None of us actually deserve what God has done for us. We have life because God loves us. Not because we deserve it, not because of some sort of, like, you know, we've always been here, we worked hard, we served all these days in my life. No, because God loves us, and now we have life. That older son was in danger of losing his privileged position, not because his father ever would not love him, but because he didn't recognize and appreciate the love that his father had for him. And so he's not able to rejoice in the joy of his father because he, he's acting like the Pharisees and the scribes. See, Jesus told these parables because there was Pharisees and there were scribes that didn't like the fact that Jesus was associating with sinners and tax collectors who don't deserve the love of God. God loves anyways, deserving or not. God still loves. Those Pharisees, those tax collectors, they serve God, generally obeying God and following a checklist of rules. 
But the reality is that they really know the heart of God. Did they truly love God? From the outside looking in, probably most of us would say, you know what, yeah, I'm not really like that older brother, and I, I certainly don't want to be like the scribes and the Pharisees. That's not who I am. I don't want to be like them. I don't want to be self-righteous. I don't want to disdain other people, look down on them. But sometimes we may feel that when we've worked hard for several years, when we've remained faithful and obeying the Lord for a long time, when we've kept commitments and made sacrifices for the sake of the Lord's work, maybe we deserve a little bit of appreciation. Maybe there should be a celebration for us. Have you ever sort of felt that way? By the way, we're still in the book of Joshua. You think, Kevin, I don't understand. Well, I thought we were in Joshua. We are still in Joshua. Today we're going to consider some people that had remained faithful in obeying the Lord for a long time period of time. People who had committed themselves, who had made sacrifices in obedience to the will of the Lord. Uh, Last week you might, or last time I preached, you might remember we were in chapter 14, and we were discussing Caleb and uh, his inheritance in the promised land. From chapters 13 through 21, there's basically an allotment of the different tribes and and their inheritance that they're going to receive, okay? And so I decided I'm not going to like do a sermon every week about somebody else's inheritance and describe that on the map and look at, you know, where all their territory is, because that would be somewhat repetitive. And so we looked at Caleb, specifically, and his his receiving of that uh, inheritance. But we recognize that as, so then, when all this allotment has taken place, really, that's just a, a, a very finite period of time, right? Okay, this is just all these allotments, they're going through, and they're, and they're doing, they're dividing up the land. You'll remember from that incident with Caleb, that he was, how old was he by that money chance? Do you remember? He was 85. Okay, he was 85. And you'll remember that uh, there was two, 10 spies that we don't remember their name, and the two, we remember their names, what the names that we remember? Joshua and Caleb, right? And when Joshua and Caleb and those 10 others that we don't remember the name for, uh, who was it? Somebody was said to me afterwards, oh yeah, oh, was it you, Andre? Somebody was said to me, oh, yeah, I was going to try to remember that one time, and then I never did. Uh, just uh, somebody said it. I don't know. And, you know, you think, oh, yeah, it's going to be one of those trivia questions that no one will ever know, and I'll know it. So. But the reality is, you know, we, th- we remember Joshua and Caleb. And when those spies went, how old was Caleb then? Anybody remember that one? Forty, right? And so we can figure out the math, right? So, okay, 40, he was 40 then. God uh, had them wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Now, they might have been in the wilderness for some time before that actually happened as well. But at the very least, at the very least, if he was 85 and there was 40, that's 45, but there was 40 years, that's at least five years, and maybe even as much as seven, that these people had crossed the Jordan River and now were, had been conquering the land. So they've been doing this for like five, maybe seven years, Okay. And before crossing the Jordan River, you might remember that there were some tribes that inherited land on the other side. Uh, On the other side, there was uh, Sion, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and all their territory was taken, and God allowed uh, certain tribes to have territory on the, which side of the river is that? That's, uh, you know, the the east side, right? It's like, which side is my right? On the east side of the river, and that was the, the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half-tribe of Manasseh. They received inheritance on the east side of the river. And so, but there was a stipulation. They were going to receive this land, but they couldn't actually, the men of valor, the, the warrior men, they had to make a commitment to God's people, to the rest of their brothers, and they needed to cross the river and assist them in taking the land west of the Jordan River. And so what they did is they left their wives and their children and their livestock, all their things, on the east side, and they went in command of the Lord to help their brothers. And they went for what, how long? For like five years, maybe seven years, that they made this commitment, a long period of time where they had committed themselves to the service of God to help their brothers in taking the land on the west side. 
And so that's the story up to this point, and now we're going to find out what happens to these tribes. And so that brings us to our text today, which is in chapter 22. And so hopefully you have your Bibles ready, or your apps, your finger on your app, ready to push whichever chapter we're going to be in. It's in chapter 22 of Joshua. And let's go ahead and read verses 1 through 6. At that time, Joshua summoned the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh and said to them, You have kept all that Moses, a servant of the Lord, commanded you, and have obeyed my voice in all that I have commanded you. You have not forsaken your brothers these many days down to this day, but have been careful to keep the charge of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brothers as he promised them. Therefore turn and go to your tents in the land where your possession lies, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. Only be very careful to observe the commandments and uh, the commandment and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cling to him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So Joshua blessed them, and they sent, and sent them away, and they went to their tents. These men certainly should be commended for their loyalty to the word of the Lord, to their brothers. They had fought, they had sacrificed, they had made, remained true for many days, in fact, years. And now Joshua is sending them home to their families. It's over, right? They can let their guard down now. Yes, there's, there's rest in the land. But you ever notice sometimes when it seems like the battle's not obvious in front of you that actually the battle might be f- raging even more fiercely than you recognize? The physical war is gone, but that doesn't mean that there's not going to be a spiritual battle that still remains. It may not be quite as obvious, but we need to be ready for it. And so it's not a time to let their guard down in particular, It's a time to be the same as they've always been. That they've been true to the Lord, they've been loyal, they've been obedient to God's word, and now they need to be very careful. Because at a time when you think you can let your guard down, that's the time when you need to be very careful that you actually stay true to that command. That what's the one command? He gives them one command that he wants to highlight to them. And that one command is to love the Lord they're a God, which doesn't surprise us, right? When Jesus was asked, well, what's the greatest commandment? You know, there's all these commandments. What's the greatest commandment? And what did Jesus say? You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. He said, and the second is like it. You should love your neighbor as yourself. In Luke's account, there's a follow-up question. Remember the follow-up question? Uh, well, okay, that's great. Who's my neighbor? And we're pretty familiar with that other parable. If I asked you, oh, what parable did he tell then? You'd say, the Good Samaritan, right? We know, we know the Good Samaritan. And we recognize then that from that passage, we recognize that the neighbor, who's the neighbor that I'm supposed to love? Well, it's not just the people that I'm like. It could actually be somebody that I maybe traditionally stay away from. And we recognize that love isn't just about, you know, how you feel. It's about acts of compassion. And it's not about whether our person deserves it or not, or if they're the same as us or not, or if we feel affection for them or not. It's because love is the fulfillment of the law of God. And so that's why one is to love. That's why it's the most important command of all. As an application uh, to us today, Now, this seems like a far removed thing, but I want us to focus on verse 5. Because the reality is, in verse 5, he tells them a command that is a principle for life for us as well. That they they need to be very careful. What's they need to be very careful about? Well, we have to be that too. Let me see if I can get there. There we go. Need to be very careful to obey the command to love our Lord, right? And we recognize that Jesus Christ is Lord. That God sent his son to die on our behalf. 
And that if we put our faith in him, we're not just putting our faith in him so that our, our sins will be forgiven and we can have heaven one day. The point is that we do that and let him be Lord. That he's in control. And we need to be very careful that we keep our command to love Jesus, to love our Lord. See, if love is not dependent on my feelings, if it's a fulfillment of God's plan for my life, then I need to be very careful and intentional about loving God because I may not always feel like it. Right? I may not always feel like it. I may not find myself, uh, you know, I might have strong feelings somewhere else. You ever get lured in by stuff? It seems really flashy and attractive and it's like it's right up my preference zone or whatever. I don't know what you call it, whatever you want, however way you want to say that, but something can lure you in and maybe that luring in is taking you actually away from God's plan. It might seem really attractive and so we have to be very careful because it's not just about the way we feel or how we feel or our, or our preferences or, or things that are alluring to us. It actually needs to be something that's very intentional. Joshua expands on this command to love the Lord. He says, and, but really this is almost like a how to love as he continues in the verse. In order to love, we need to, in order to truly love Jesus, we need to walk like Jesus walked. The next verb in that passage is to walk. To say the words are easy, right? But to truly walk and talk and think like Jesus takes, a, it's, a, it's a whole other level. When Jesus walked this earth, sure, he had lots of followers. He had lots of people that appreciated him. Do you like to be appreciated? Anybody like to be appreciated? I love being appreciated. I'll, I'll admit it. Most of us do. He had other people that were just kind of curious. You know, Jesus also had other people that were actually his enemies. The thing is, Jesus only did good. His character was completely pure. And yet, there were some that hated him and despised him and rejected him. He was killed. So I just walk like Jesus walked, right? And I think to myself, yeah, I want to be that person that's good and whose character is pure. But about the other stuff, I'm not so sure, like, you know, hated and despised and rejected. Like, yeah, it doesn't sound too appealing. Take up your cross daily. Right? Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, take up his cross daily and follow me. Right? You have to deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. Doesn't sound like an exciting path, but we recognize the value in that. We recognize who Jesus is. We know that Jesus loved us, and we are so grateful that he loved us, and so he loved us first, and we ought to also be like him. Second, or I guess I, sh I should have put just the top one without a number on it, but anyways, because the main idea is that we love. And then to truly love Jesus, we need to walk like Jesus. Second, the next thing he says is to truly love Jesus, we need to do what he said. So follow his commands. You know, obey the commands of the Lord. Uh, God has generally given people a moral compass. Most people know the difference between good and evil, right and wrong. But not everything is quite so simple. Because sometimes right and wrong is based on a, uh, a society that's bombarded us with what we, it's been telling us is right and what's wrong. And so that messes up with our conscience that God gave us in the first place. You know, for example, you know, we may justify our actions. We may compare ourselves to others. You know, I thank God that I'm not like those people over there, those cheaters, those liars, those fornicators, those tax evaders. You know, I fast, I pray, I, I give my tithes. You know, I go to church, I read my Bible. Jesus teaches us that it's not only about our actions. That's not all that matters, but it's about the attitude behind the actions. It's what's in our heart. Right? And so we listen to Jesus' words because we recognize that, you know, just following along, it has to also be something that's in our heart, not just something that we walk through the motions. 
And so we need to listen to what he said. And Jesus, especially, you, you really get it really strongly when you look at the Sermon on the Mount and you see, you've you heard that it was said, don't do this, but I say, don't even think about it. Whatever's in your heart, that, that's, that's the thing. This is, uh, this is uh, I'll give an alert here just to Lawrence because I told him he was supposed to listen to the sermon in case he was forgetting to do that. Here's the part where you have to listen, Lawrence. I told him I'd give him a test afterwards. So, um, Somebody noticed that there was a lot of people hugging today. So uh, there you go. That's the next part. To truly love Jesus, we need to cling to him. Literally, it's to hug. Okay? The little literal Hebrew is to the idea of hugging. It's this idea of clinging, embracing. Um, some translations say, say, you know, be loyal to, hold fast to, and I understand those things, but I'm a hugger, so I like, I like hug, cling, cling, embrace. Uh, if you just want to hold on to something, that's great. This has to do with the understanding that we need God. We need him. It reminds me of the brine and the brine. That's mixing the vine and the branches together, the brine. The vine and the branches example. Yeah, that, that works fine if y'all understand what I'm trying to say, right? But if you don't, like, what's he saying, the brine? I, I love that example. It's one of my favorite examples of Jesus, right? And you've heard me say that before because you know, it is, so I keep on saying it. Um, but in that example, you know, those branches, they're not actually going to really give, be life-giving. They're not going to produce fruit unless they hold fast, they cling to, they remain in Jesus Christ, the vine. There's this necessity, the source of full life, of meaningful life, of fruitful life, doesn't happen if there's not this clinging to, holding fast to, absolute loyalty to Jesus Christ. And so in order to obey this command to love the Lord, there's, there's this recognition that, you know what, I, I, I'm not going to be producing fruit all by myself here. Not fruit that's going to be God-honoring fruit. And so, you know, that branch, you imagine the branch, if the branch doesn't produce fruit, what happens? It's cut off. And what happens to that branch? It shrivels up and dies. It, it, it withers. And then they gather the branches and throw them into the fire, right? And so we recognize that we really, truly love Jesus. We need to, we need him. We need to cling to him. If we let go of Jesus, if we think somehow we're going to do things on our own, uh, we're sadly mistaken, and we end up withering and dying. The last thing that he says is to truly love Jesus, we need to serve him with all our heart and soul. In the Old Testament, this idea of heart and soul, heart has to do with the idea of the intellect. We often think intellect, that's not right. Heart's supposed to be your feelings, your emotions. Well, in the Old Testament, heart was the idea of your intellect, your will, your intentions, Okay. And soul had to do with your emotions, your personality even, your desires. We understand that loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, it, it's really about all of our being, right? And that if we really love him with all of our being, then we serve him with all of our being as well. And we also recognize probably that Jesus doesn't really ask us to do anything that he didn't do himself. Um, Like Jesus' early disciples, we tend to like to be recognized. We like to be first, maybe. Like to have some sort of special standing. You remember James and John, and their the mom comes and brings them to Jesus and says, Oh, yeah, like, you know, if I could just have, if you could have one of my sons sit on your right and your left when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus talks to them and says, Oh, are you able to drink the cup that I'm going to drink? Oh, yeah, we can do it. And he says, Well, you will, but you don't have no idea what you're talking about. And of course, the other disciples, they're all like indignant with the, the two of them. And they're like, but really, if, it, if they had just got on the inside track themselves, they would have been there too. 
And Jesus at that point, he calls them all to him and says to them, you know that the Gentiles lord it over them and that their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever will be great among you must be your servant. Whoever will be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, even himself, did not come to be served, but to serve. And what? And to give his life as a ransom for many. This is Jesus. You know, we're supposed to imitate him, so if that's what it looks like, then what it looks like is even the person that, who's the king of kings and lord of lords actually comes to serve. And so should we also be that too? Whether you're like the prodigal son, maybe you identify with the prodigal son who had gone off and, and messed up your life, but then realized that you needed needed to come back to Christ. Maybe you're like that person. You've come home. you embraced your loving father. Or maybe you're like the older son. You've always been there, but maybe you haven't actually appreciated what you have. Maybe when other people get celebrated, you're a little bit uh, perturbed by that. Maybe that's a nice way to say it. Or maybe you're like those tribes for years, they were separated with their fam- from their families, from all the things that they had, because they were committed, they were loyal to God, and they were doing the things that they needed to do. And now God is going to bless them to go back to their place. But the reality is, you know, maybe they should have had a big celebration for them, right? Whoever we are, whatever we might fit into those kinds of stories, the reality is that there's one command that's most important, that we need to keep a hold of, that we need to be very careful. And maybe especially very careful when we've been working hard for a long period of time and now it seems like I can take it easy for a bit. And that is that we need to be very careful to obey the command that we need to love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we know it's not just based on feelings. We know this is really a commitment, right? It's a commitment to walk like him, to listen to what he says, to recognize that we need him, we cling to him, because we depend on him in order to do the things that we ought to be able to do. And we serve him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, because Jesus Christ is Lord. He's Lord of my life, he's Lord of your life, and together... God is going to do some incredible things through us if we will let him be Lord of our lives. Maybe you're here this morning and Jesus Christ isn't Lord. Maybe you recognize that what God has done for you, that he loves you, but maybe it's hard to let go of certain feelings about other people. God can help you. Oftentimes, one of the things that I find when I'm studying with people, there's a couple things that get in the way. One of the things is, uh, well, I just can't forgive this person. There's some things that I need to get right in my life first before I commit my life to Jesus Christ. Well, guess what? If you're going to wait till you get it all sorted out in your own life before you commit to Jesus Christ, you're never going to commit to Jesus Christ. If you decide that you need God, that you recognize that he's the only way that you can have salvation, that he's the only way that you can overcome the things that are Stop, that you've never been able to overcome by yourself, and you surrender your life to him and let be, him be Lord, then he will work on changing you. But if you think you have to change first, that's backwards. Or they, they, they used to say, what, the cart before the horse, or whatever? That's backwards. We need to let him be Lord of our lives. And so if you're here today and there's something been stopping you, but recognize that, you know, God has loved you and given his son for you. And what he asks for you to do is surrender. Surrender and let him be Lord of your life. We're going to stand and sing a hymn at this time. Uh, let's, let's stand together. And if you have a request or, or a need, please come forward.